We work so hard to get through, you, to break through, right? You're just trying every step of the way to write the screenplays, to work with the actors, and then finally someone gives you a shot and then they, bam, they shut the door on your face. It felt like, well, then what's the point? For any new filmmakers watching, can you take us through the process of making a film all the way from getting financing to getting uh, cast attached, below the line people working, all of this? Yeah. yeah, if we're talking about making a like a movie specifically, that's what you mean, like actually, yeah. So um, the general process of making the movie is, you know, of course it starts with a script, gotta get a script from somewhere. Um, hopefully find financing in some way, shape or form, whether that's an investor or credit cards or something. Usually at that point, then you find casting, then it becomes, you know, putting your crew together, probably starting with someone like a cinematographer, deciding to look, the props, you move into production, and you're doing that whole scene, and then, then it's post on the end of it. That's the general building blocks, which are probably fairly obvious. The trick is how do you do it? I mean, how do you, if, you're, if you've never done it, like how do you even move that ball down the field at all? Um, that's usually the big question. How do we make a movie? How do you get, in the world do you do it? I've done three features to this point and each one of them came about in different ways. The first one, so actually the first one I ever tried to make, I. I did everything you were supposed to do. I read all the books. I read Rebel Without a Crew. I did, I read, you know, all the books that all the filmmakers read about independent film and whatever. I wrote a script. My mom told me it was really great. <laughs> and <laughs> all my friends told me how great it was. I found an investor, a guy who helped me with a business plan, but he was only willing to invest in the trailer he didn't have enough money to actually fund the whole film, but he knew business. Cool. That's something I lack. So we wrote a, we did a killer trailer. We set out to raise money. Everybody told me you have never made a feature. So how, and I was trying to raise like a million bucks. I think I was sorry, budget. Every investor said, this is a high risk investment and you've never made a movie. So how am I? How do I know I'm ever going to see it again? And how do I know you know what you're doing? I heard that over and over and over again for several years before I finally gave up. It was so demoralizing because the, actually the trailer that we made was good. We thought for sure people would be into it. Didn't work. Didn't work at all. It was not what the books told me that would happen. It was not. It was very frustrating. So here I am back square one. Got this cool movie trailer. Yay for a film that doesn't exist. Okay, so I had to go back to the drawing board and go, all right, so then how do I make a movie? How do I get this thing made? So I, I wrote a different script. And I wrote this script based on things that I knew I had access to. So I shoot a lot of underwater stuff. All right, I can, I can maybe add some of that. I wouldn't recommend that in <laughs> an independent feature film. I did it anyway. Um, wrote this little murder mystery thing. I set out to raise $40,000. 40,000. Uh, you know, I was thinking before I could, you know, I thought to myself, I've shot a lot on my camera. You know, I've shot, I have a lot of experience behind the camera. I had tried to teach myself as much as I could about filmmaking. I'd worked with another director a whole bunch and he showed me how five C stands and a couple of flags and a little light kit can really do a lot for you. So I'm like, and I learned a lot from him. He taught me all this great stuff. So I bought, I literally bought five C stands, handful of flags, had a light kit. That's it, that's all I had. Doorway dolly, little bit of track. And okay, I can, I can make a movie with just these few elements. I'll cast my friends as the actors. I'm gonna raise 40 grand. I couldn't raise 40 grand. I raised 12. <sighs> And you know, all the people that threw in was fantastic. They were all good friends of mine, but that still left me in this place of like, man, how am I supposed to pull this off without anything? I decided, well, I'm gonna take that money and use it for catering and for the couple of rentals that I need and I'm gonna do it anyway. 
So I sat out and shot for five straight weeks. Um, I shot it during, this is, this is really helpful. The people I cast, the first one was an actor who was in acting school. He was on his Christmas break for a month. So he was actually home for a month that I could grab him for. That was very helpful. Um, I did not break the shoot up into tiny pieces like a lot of people do, because that gets really dangerous because your actors, you know, someone's gonna get married, someone's gonna get a haircut. You know, trying to coordinate people for months and months and months on end is gets increasingly difficult to do. So I tried to shoot it all in one block just to get it knocked out and get it out of the way. So um, over Christmas time was a great time. Work is slow, gear is available, sometimes crew is available. That made everything exponentially easier. Um, I paid everybody with food. Had a friend do the cake. We, we, we came up with this little, and, I, and by the way, everything, we had a crew of five. Every, all the lighting fit in my SUV. And the, I had this little Tupperware container with um, you know, napkins, forks and knives, salt and pepper, things like that. That the, This uh, friend of mine was kind of helping us cater and she would fill that up and had all the crafty in it. And I could just pull it out and wheel it to set and she would bring like a casserole or something every morning. It was a great little system. She wasn't there all day, but it was something so that the crew was taken care of. And uh, I planned like I've never planned before. Like I, I went and looked at each location. I measured each room to make sure that the, because I wanted to know if I want to do a doorway dolly shot through this little doorway, is it even wide enough for me to do that? So I measured it to make sure it was right and then pre-planned out where all my shots would be so that I could be a military operation in every single location because I did not have the money to, to be able to do extra reshoots and things like that. So I had this giant three ring binder like this that with every little detail of every scene, which scene came before, which scene came after so that I could meet because I didn't have a scripty. I had myself. I was DP, I had three film students, and I had a art department person and a stunt coordinator. Like those were, that was it, that's all I had. So I needed to be able to create a system to where I could do it all myself. Um, and I did it, I pulled it off. Now I will say it was one of the most exhausting experiences of my life. Um, it, I actually put myself in the hospital from exhaustion. I ended up passing out in the shower um, but I did it, I got it done. And sometimes making your first feature will take that to, you'll have, you may, hopefully not, you may have to push yourself further than you ever thought possible. But if you want it, this might be what you have to do. Push yourself so much further than you thought. And it wasn't like I had this great day job gig where I could afford to take all this time off. I couldn't, I was living on credit cards and I had to push and push and push. Now here's the thing. That film, you, it's, you can watch it if you want. It's a $12,000 movie. It's never gonna be, it, it's a 12, it looks like a, and sounds like a $12,000 movie and it's not anything great. You can, it's on Amazon, it's called The Human Trace. You can watch it if you want. Watch it only to inspire you to make something better. Um, I would also tell you at the same time, go watch Christopher Nolan's Following. It was shot for like six grand. So, but because Christopher Nolan made following, he got to make Memento, right? Sometimes it takes that first one to get you out the door. And if no one is giving you a shot, you're just gonna have to figure out how to give it to yourself. That's what I had to do. And it took everything I had to make it happen. But I will tell you that after, you know, 25 years later, it is the, my most proudest accomplishment because I did it on my own and I did it and I made it happen. It won a couple of awards, did okay in the fact, it was never sold for a lot of money. It didn't do, you know, you, we're all hoping, we're all hoping that when we do it, that that's gonna be the thing that opens the door. Don't count on that. It probably won't. Hey, if it happens for you, that's fantastic, but be careful what, how you pin your hopes on, on that one project. And I learned that in the biggest way on film number two. So, so film number one was done the true indie filmmaker way, which was 
<laughs> blood, sweat, and tears, doing everything yourself, you know, all of that. Um, even to the point, I, we recorded like all the underwater sounds by taking a microphone and putting a condom around it and dipping it in a swimming pool and then making underwater sounds and did all the sound design like that. Like it was, it was interesting. Safe recording. That, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> no one got pregnant. Um, uh, so that's one way that you can do it. And I will say that the process of that, now the film itself did not open doors. However, from that point forward, I could tell people that I made a movie. They're not gonna watch this movie. That doesn't matter. I could tell people that I made the movie. That did help when it came to the second one because I was able to tell people I've done this before. I've been through this mill before. I know how to make a two hour story and make it hold together. The second film was done, was paid for by an, a large organization that they wanted to dramatize a book. So this is an interesting, now this is another way you can make films happen. And I've seen people do this because they will take a story and wrap it around a cause. If you can attach your story to say a book, like in the case of this, it was a, a book they wanted to dramatize, or you can come up with a cause, say, I don't know, voting rights or ending childhood hunger or something, right? There are organizations that really you know, they're champions of this and, and massive organizations that are around that fight this kind of thing. And you can get them to partner with you. You will also have a built-in audience. It's a great way to get a film going if, if, if your film has some sort of bent like that. It'll give you a platform, access to investors and things like that. Cool, that's fantastic. And it also is, it feels good when you get out of bed in the morning because you're making a film that's actually doing good like this. So my next film was like that. What that means is, that means two things. I'm working for a client. That's different than your own little film. This is gonna be more like what it was like working in a studio. And I'm also making a film based on pre-existing material. So I'm adapting a book for a client. So that means that I have to work with a committee of people who are dictating the story and they're telling me things they want in it, certain agendas that they have. That is, a, that is what you will run into when you do a, a film for an organization. This is, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It can be a very collaborative feeling. It, in this case, it was a very positive creative experience. Uh, the, the executive producer and myself are very good friends to this day. We're still working together. Um, we made this film, it's called The Record Keeper. It, it was a wonderful experience to make. It's a steampunk sci-fi thriller about angels and all that, it was super, super fun. But the organization decided at the end of it not to release it. And it's a whole long sort of story as to why, but this taught me lesson number two, which is when you tie your hopes to what your project can do or will do. It's a dangerous place to be. It's, it's, some people refer to that as living in the future. You are, I, I, I wish I could remember which sports team this was, but I know there's a famous story about a football team that was, that it was playing this game and this one team thought they had won it. And I think there was an interception or a tackle or something and team A, Oh, that's it, we won the game. And the fans started flooding the, the stadium and things like that, but the play wasn't over. And the other team somehow grabbed the ball, picked it up and run it to the other end zone. And it was discovered somehow in this crazy celebration that they actually lost. Viewers may remember what this story is. I can't quite remember what it is off the top of my head, but that, that this is actually something that happened. This is an example of a team that got so focused on the future of winning X, going to film festival, winning, winning Sundance, that they completely lost sight of where they actually were. And that was a very devastating lesson for me to learn, which was we made this film, we were winning awards, people were so excited, we were on set, you could feel the magic in the air as we were creating it, we're working with actors, the story was really cool. We felt like we were on this launching pad 
And all of a sudden, we go launching into the stratosphere and the organization says, no. And I took a tumble off of that into a very dark place to the point where I almost gave up making films. It was so hard because you, we work so hard to get through, you, to break through, right? You're just trying every step of the way to write the screenplays, to work with the actors, and then finally someone gives you a shot and then they bam, they shut the door on your face. It felt like, well, then what's the point? You know, it just, it, I seriously thought about, my wife and I talked at length about maybe we should just go teach English in Korea or something and, and just give up. Uh, it was because I was pinning my hopes on what it, I thought it was gonna do up here. Uh, and I lost sight of where, the reality of where it actually was, realizing this is a very real possibility. This, the signs were there going along that this could happen, but I just didn't want to see it. I just believed that it would do better than that. So I recovered from that whole experience, which took some time, took a lot of licking of the wounds. And eventually down the line, I got back on my feet. I ended up at this, for a time I worked, I did, I ended up getting a job. It was a way that I, I, I got to LA. And this is something very interesting because I feel like the second film that I did, if I had lived in LA, things would have turned out differently because my friend circle would have been different. Well, I was living in another city and the people that I was surrounded by and people making movies, the, the artists involved were just from that city. If I had been in LA, making this with LA people, I think other, it would have been higher exposure. I think the results would have been different. That's as a side note. So after all this went down, it was also financially devastating. So I had to find a way to get to LA after all of this, after this huge wound and, and, and all right, now I need, I need to get down there and try to figure out a way to make this happen. So I ended up taking a full-time job, which was, very that you know after going whoop I want to be I'm going to be famous ah <laughs> I'm going to work a full time job at a job I hate I'm the world's worst person right so boom so I'm in this full time job but but while I was in this job first of all I gave myself a time limit I'm not I'm only going to be here for a year this is just to get me to L A so I I did that and while I was in the job. I thought, okay, I need to get film number three off the ground. I can't let this second experience be the death of me. I can't let that be the defining moment of my life. So I went to the Austin Film Festival and I met Dwayne Worrell there and we connected and I followed up with him. This is the traditional way how movies are supposed to be made, right? So we get back to LA, we became fast friends. He sends me the script. I couldn't put it down. I love the script so much. I asked him if it was okay if I pitched it around. He said yes. I went to another film festival, connected with these other group of producers, came back, pitched it to them. They said, that's great, that's a green light. Now this is the traditional way of how you want it to happen in Hollywood, right? So these are three different possible ways of how films get made. Is any of them right or wrong? Absolutely not. Um, but it's just a way of demonstrating and how this actually happens. Um, the third way I will say is, has been the most interesting because I'm working for a production house who's done multiple films. There's a great comfort in that because they have had things distributed way more than I have. They have done, they, they understand the ins and outs of the other side of the business that I'm not as familiar with. Um, that's fantastic. There's also a great, because I'm in LA, I have a great network of filmmakers to choose from to help me make this thing. That's also a huge asset. Uh, it's given us access to film festivals um, that I didn't have before. So there's enormous value in going after a film like that, uh, in that way. Now, the film is about to release at the time of this recording, so we will see how this particular process goes, but um, you know, it, so how is a film made? It's, it's in any way that you possibly can. It's, you, you, 
I had to put myself in the hospital to make the first one. I had to take a job I hated for the third. And all of them were worth it. Because once you're there and you're doing it, it is the, the dream that we've all striven for, it, it's real. It, it's magic. It's, it's fantastic. It's the best job in the world.